Logistics Insiders, we're so happy to welcome you to the first in a series of our Facebook Live series on overcoming injuries. And today we're really going to focus on understanding the relationship between psychology and physiology in gymnasts. And we're so thrilled to have two incredible experts in the field that have worked with us on Inside Gymnastics in the past. I'm Christy Sandmeyer, I'm the Editorial Director, and I'm so pleased to welcome Robert Andrews and Gina Pengeni for this incredible conversation. They've put together such a thorough presentation for you. They will also be taking questions, and like I said, this will be the first in a three-part series that we'll bring to you from Inside Gymnastics. So I'm excited to see what they have to say and excited to bring this presentation to all of you. So with that, I turn the floor over to Robert and Gina. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank You're you, welcome. Christy, for all your support throughout Thank the years. You. Um, as a magazine and as an entity, you guys have always been so pervasive with communication on making sure that the athletes and the coaches and medical staff and national team staff, that everyone has the ability to have a voice. So um, from a media perspective, um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to write for you and travel with the magazine and everything. So we really appreciate this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Ditto. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, All right, Chris. Always, always, always an honor to, uh, to contribute with you guys. And, and uh, yeah. thank you for allowing me to have my voice and, and help where I can. 100%. Thank you for being such amazing advocates and good luck. Have fun. I'll be here cheering you on from the background and <laughs> we'll provide everybody with information on our website following the presentation and information on the part two and part three soon. Fabulous. We love it. We love it. Um, all right. So let me just, um, I am moderating the uh, the screen sharing of this. So for everyone with Inside Nation who's watching, if we have a couple hiccups, just uh, be patient with us because Robert is obviously in Texas. Um, I am in um, Chicago and we're trying to be live together, um, but separate. So um, we hope everyone is staying happy and safe. So the format of how we're, we're going to go today is that um, Robert, is a psychologist and I'm a physical therapist. We both work with um, national team gymnasts, Olympic gymnasts, uh, NCAA, um, our nation's and world's best, and we both have a wide variety of experience with sports. So we are, um, the intro session is today, it's session one of three. It's the mix of mind and body, right? The psychology and the physiology of injury. What happens to your body when you get injured? What happens to your mind? What your hormones go through? What your body goes through? Um, what your medical team and family and the people that support you go through? Um, and today is just going to be a general overview. Uh, we both have very lengthy um, presentations that are uh, hundreds of slides long on the psychology of injury that we have both given at um, presentations which will pop up on our YouTubes or um, a place that we will share in the long run. In the meantime, we have a very small condensed version of that. Um, I will be sharing that on the screen while Robert is um, speaking and then likewise while I'm speaking. At first, we're probably going to take about 10-15 minutes and each just do a small intro and presentation and then we're going to kind of meet in the middle and do a bounce back and forth of just a general discussion um, and then at the end, of course, um, I am monitoring on Facebook Live, so um, any questions that you have, please pop it into the comment section and we will be more than happy to address it. We do have some questions that have been sent in in advance as well. We're trying to address those. So um, I will do an intro on myself real quick and then we'll have Robert do so and then uh, we'll get going. So I was a gymnast for 14 years, Region 5 strong. Um, I then went to Marquette University to get my master's in physical therapy and pre-med as well as um, Michigan State Public Health Communications um, Masters along with coaching college. I coached elites. I coached at Swiss Turners for seven years and have been an elite level um, clinician um, across the country for uh, 26 years. Um, I have a practice in Chicago, a chief physical therapy, where I'm a co-owner and a proud partner in Neurosport, which is a neuro tour company focusing on, on performing arts and orthopedics. MedGym is the gymnastics consulting firm uh, where we go around the country and help to make sure everyone is educated, safe, and healthy. 
Um, so we work with psychologists all the time. Um, it is very rare that I will work with someone that's going through a major injury and not request that they work with um, sports psychology. If they have their own personal psychologist, we do try to pull it to someone that specifically understands sports and injuries, which of course, um, Robert is um, absolutely amazing. So I am blessed and honored to be presenting alongside him for three of these sessions and hopefully um, some really neat co-PowerPoints and presentations that y'all can use for your uh, staff education as well. So without further ado, um, I, oh, I have to go this way on the screen. I present to you, Mr. Robert Andrews. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Gina. Uh, I'm Robert Andrews. Uh, I'm in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm the founder and director of the Institute of Sports Performance, uh, where we focus on uh, mental training skills, injury recovery, building culture, uh, team development. Uh, I'm a licensed mental health provider. I'm actually not a psychologist. I have a master's degree in psychology, so I'm a psychotherapist. I can't call myself a psychologist because I don't have a PhD degree. Um, I work with a lot. I started working with gymnasts back in 2007. Uh, Sean Golden, Raj, Bob Zar, and uh, uh, Sean Townsend were the first three gymnasts that I ever worked with. So I got some of the best in the country and the world right out of the chute, and uh, and then got on board Justin Laurie and some other guys down here in Houston. We worked together. I was helping them prepare for the uh, 08 Olympic trials, Beijing Olympic trials. And then from there, I worked with the men's national team 2009 to 2012. And then interestingly enough, after I left that position, I started seeing a lot of uh, female gym, uh, gymnasts on the women's side in the United States, Canada, uh, other, uh, other countries around the world, Australia. I uh, also worked with uh, uh, track and field athletes, swimming athletes, Olympic champions in gymnastics and swimming and uh, track and field, NFL players, Major League Baseball players. But what got me into all this was uh, I suffered a bunch of injuries when I was younger. When I was in seventh grade, um, I had Osgood Slaughter's disease and then a whole bunch of injuries, which I'll get into more in a, a little bit later. But uh, I worked with Heisman Trophy winners, NCAA champions, All-Americans, and uh, but interestingly enough, when I start working with the athlete, the first place I always go is, have you suffered any serious sports-related injuries? Uh, just because that takes up so much space in the brain. And a lot of times I go, oh, yeah, but I'm fine. You know, oh, I'm okay now. And after we dig in a little bit deeper, that's not always the case. So I'm going to be expanding upon some of those concepts and principles as we work our way into this. So uh, happy to be paired up with you here. We're going to do some amazing things over these next three sessions. So I've been pretty stoked all day. I kept looking at my watch all day like, <laughs> you know, where, where's five o'clock? Where's five o'clock? Let's go. All right, uh, Robert, I am going to pull... Um I uh, just as a side note before I get your PowerPoint up and get you started, um, we are um, in in my working with national team, our Olympians, people from across the country, our NCAA champions, and throughout the world. Um, I see a lot of the same thing that Robert sees, and if you picture a Venn diagram, um, where although he is not a a physical medicine person, and I am not a mental health person, we do have a twenty to thirty percent, I would say, overlap in that he can't. Um, not understand the physical side and I can't not right. understand the mental side mm -hmm. in order yeah. to treat. So when we're going through injuries, if you are seeing a PT or an MD or an ATC or somebody that does not work with someone that parallels with psych um, of any sort, it is incredibly important to make sure that you direct them that way. It literally makes the physical aspect of recovery better. And psychologically, um, when we can make the mind better, we can make the physical body better and vice versa. So um, we are, uh, our, our three goals as health professionals and as a team of us coming together and then many more, we have a med gym wellness group starting, which is a plethora of medical professionals, is to make sure that the athletes are the safest possible and that they have the most amount of information at their disposal to make the best decisions. Um, and that happens when there's a team of people, athletic trainer, massage therapist, acupuncture, uh, sports psychologist, the coach, the parent, the gym owner. Um, you know, there's so many different people around and it is very important that everyone is communicative um, and on the same page, that there's HIPAA releases so that um, Robert and I can talk about a patient that we're seeing so he can say, hey, um, Sally's having a really bad day. Um, I think we need to do this or she might not be as productive productive with strength testing because I can tell that her cortisol levels are off or whatever it is. It's really, really helpful. So I urge you to um, make sure that you create a team wherever you are. Um, 
And if you don't have one that you reach out to us because we can assist you in that. It's what I do with my business and setting people up locally with people like Robert um, and we can talk about it. So, okay, I'm going to hide myself, Robert, and then I'll okay. pull your uh, PowerPoint up. All right. Can you still hear me? All right. I'm assuming. All right. I'm assuming that you can still hear me keeping my fingers crossed. Um, so as I was saying earlier in uh, seventh grade, I grew like nine inches in a year and um, my patellar tendon started te tearing away from my uh, Fibula and tibula, it's called osgood slaughter disease. So I missed that whole year of sports and it was during a time, uh, let me see, I got a note here. Yes, we can hear you, great, thank you. Um, it was in seventh grade, it was during a time when my parents were going to, through a pretty horrific divorce and that coupled with not being able to connect to sports and the injury was very devastating for me. In ninth grade, I suffered a broken arm, separated shoulder and a concussion Sophomore year, I tore three ligaments, the medial meniscus, strained the patellar tendon, and ruptured the fluid capsule in my right knee. Um, missed the end of the football season. But interestingly enough, with that type of an injury back in the, the 70s, I was back playing football nine months later, which I don't know how I did it because it was a devastating injury. Um, senior year, I caught a pass and tipped the, the football to me and separated three ribs from my sternum, had another concussion college, I separated this shoulder again. So um, my body was literally torn up from sports. And I remember back in those days, people that were struggling coming back from injuries were called you know, head cases. Oh, he's just a head case or she's a head case. And they would just completely just write us off because they didn't understand that there was a mental and emotional psychological component that, that being afraid of getting hurt again was actually the brain doing its job. And so um, I tried playing college football after that injury. I, I gave it up. I did oil and gas for a while, investment banking for a while. Those markets just blew up with Black Monday. The oil and gas market in Texas crashed. I went back to graduate school and got a degree in psychology, master's degree in psychology. Did traditional therapy for many, many years with an emphasis on trauma, serious uh, fatal, near fatal automobile accidents, uh, near death at childbirth, mountain climbing accidents. Uh, all kinds of horrific things. And then in 2006 or 2007, I kind of had this, wow, this epiphany that all the trauma work that I had done with serious accidents and things like that would help injured athletes overcome the psychological psychological component of their injury. And so I started advertising to athletic directors and folks like that in the Houston area about what I was doing. And they started sending me injured athletes. And by God, the process that I had integrated worked and so i knew that i was on to something and i started seeing broken ankles and acl injuries and tommy john surgery and so um <clears throat> gene if you could advance this one slide here i would appreciate that so what i started looking at was what i started noticing that injuries were not just physical in nature that i started seeing that uh in addition to the intense pain from a torn acl or a broken ankle, there was this surge of emotion that the athlete experienced. There were surges of all kinds of uh, hormones related to stress and trauma, adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine. Uh, I also noticed that when I talked to these athletes, they could all tell me things that they specifically remembered about the point in time when they got injured or what it was like sitting in the, in the gym watching other athletes or sitting on the sidelines with their team, not being able to compete. Uh, there was in, an incredible number of losses they experienced, connection, identity, uh, leadership roles, college scholarships, recruiting process. So I noticed that, um, that they were really uh, struggling with these losses. Many of them had a tremendous fear of this, this, the process of surgery. Uh, they had images in their mind of, they would say, well, I just see the surgeon cutting open my knee, or I'm afraid they're going to operate on the new knee, or the wrong knee or what if uh, I wake up in surgery and they don't know that, that I'm not asleep anymore and I feel everything that they're doing. These were irrational, but, but valid fears that they had. And so we worked with, we began working with that. They had fear and insecurities about the rehab process. They had to learn how to trust their bodies all over again. Many of them had sleep disturbances, hypervigilant changes in personality, 
very, very positive, wonderful, dynamic kids became shut down, depressed, isolated. Um, I had one story where I worked with a college volleyball, a high school volleyball player who had torn her ACL. And prior to uh, her getting injured, she sang all the time. She was in her school choir. She sang around the house. And for one year, she stopped singing. And her parents got in to see me because she was playing again, but she was terrified of getting hurt. So we went through the whole treatment protocol and uh, she was playing great again. She got rid of her brace. She was jumping, landing on one feet or two, which are things we look at. But one, her mother called me one day and she said, all of her performance stuff is great. But what we're most happy about is she came downstairs today and she was singing again. And I got tears in my eyes and I was like, that right there is why I do this. The, the volleyball was great, but the fact that the parents began to see her personality return was just was just ecstatic for me. And so we look at all of these different uh, symptoms that I just told you. And by the end of, of our, our work together, we want all those symptoms to be gone to where they're 100 percent confident in their knee, their ankle, their arm, their shoulder, whatever that might be. Their fear of in re-injury is diminished. The horrific images, holographic imprints that I'm going to talk about in a little bit have faded away and just about disappeared. And if they do see them, there's no there's no charge, there's no energy around that. So that's where we start off. They walk in, get on a call with me or walk into my office, and that's what they have going on is everything that I just listed. So Gina, if you could advance one more time there, please. And then one more time and the word trauma should pop up. Yeah, so I treat injuries just like a, a bad car wreck or uh, some, some kind of horrific incident. And, and it's the same protocols the same approach that I used back in the days when I worked with bad car wrecks and domestic violence and things like that. It's the same protocols that I use in my, my work with injuries. And so one more advance here, Gina. All right. Uh, this isn't real clear, but this is a, an image of the brain and it talks about uh, the limbic system. And I'm going to, I'm going to get into some other slides that, ex that expand upon what's going on. But this is the part of the brain that, that we're, we're interested in. The, the limbic system is a very, very primitive part of the brain. It's been around for as long as we've been around. You know, I always hear people say, you know, back in the day, the days of cavemen and cave women, if they were out gathering berries and water and they heard a saber toothed tiger, they would circle up and point their spears out and try to get back to the cave. Uh, because that part of their brain would light up and say, it's time to protect you and every, your family and everyone else. Well, when we go through injuries, that's the part of the brain that lights up. And I'm going to educate you all on what happens with brain functioning and nerve functioning and the body with a traumatic injury, gymnastics injury. And I'm going to give examples of uh, some pretty horrific uh, gym injuries that I've worked with. So go ahead and advance one more time there. All right. So this is this comes from an app that I use. It's a 3D brain app. And uh, you can spin it. It has all these different aspects of different parts of the brain that when you click that, that part of the brain will pop up. And this is the limbic system. There's actually three parts to it. The little blue dot right there in the middle is called the amygdala. And that's what's driving the bus. So the amygdala, we go through the day and our amygdala just scans the horizon. And it makes real simple interpretations. Is what we're experiencing here safe? Or if it, is it threatening? If it says it's safe, it sends an all-clear signal. Everything calms down. If it perceives something as threatening, it fires up these other parts of the brain. I'm going to expand their roles in just a minute. And it starts, it starts looking for that harmful event or experience that's coming at us so that it can go in protection mode to keep us safe. So one more advance, if you would, please. This is the frontal view of that same image in this app. And if you notice, there's two amygdala and they sit just above and behind the eyes and they're like a pair of eyes and they're taking in everything that we see, hear, feel, experience, sound, uh, perception. Uh, I worked with a gymnast years ago that had an accident on high bar and uh, they can remember the, the lights very vividly, the lights in the gym, the name of the, the company on the mats coming up towards their face as they got ready to hit the bar and their brain was taking snapshot images of that. So one more advance here. So the amygdala regulates emotion uh, and it sends information to one part of the brain, that little green part called the hippocampus. And the, the hippocampus is associated with past and current present memories. And so it, it stores certain types of information around uh, memory. 
the greater the stimulation of the hippocampus, there's a diminished ability for the brain to distinguish between what happened in the past and what's happening in the present. So the more energized, the more amped up that part of the brain gets, it can't tell past experiences from present experiences. And it has no concept of time when it really gets activated like that. So if a gymnast, uh, let's say they, I worked with a girl who peeled off of bars and broke both arms, both forearms, okay? The next time she goes, when she's healed and done a re rehab, the next time she goes to get on bars, her brain associates what happened back then with what she's going through right now. And oftentimes they'll balk, they just can't do it. A lot of times that's where mental blocks come from. Whenever I work with a, a gymnast with mental blocks, I always ask first any serious injuries. Oftentimes they say, yes, I got disoriented on floor and landed on my head and I had a concussion or it scared me or I hurt my neck uh, with bars beam i split the beam many times and got hurt i got disoriented on floor uh vault uh i i ran through and, and rolled my ankle really bad so the this part of the brain does oftentimes doesn't know the difference between what happened in the past and what's going on now the purple part is the prefrontal cortex it takes emotional information from the amygdala and it, it helps ascertain is this safe or threatened threatened uh threatening it's very sensitive to movements, sounds, situations, cues, triggers, light, pressure, temperature, voice, uh, things like that. And it takes that information and again, it says, is this safe or threatening? And if it's threatening, it stores that information. Uh, incidents or triggers the brain sees is connected to the original injury are critical for us to process and work our way through. For example, uh, if a gymnast uh, is doing a tumbling pass on floor, and comes down like I was at a, a gym one time and a guy did a he was doing a, his uh, opening tumbling pass and he landed and just went down and he tore his Achilles tendon. He said it felt like his foot went through the floor. And so when he got back and was ready to go, he was at a meet getting ready to start the meet. And all of a sudden he comes over and he goes, I see it in my mind. I'm afraid it's going to happen again. And this was a year later. And so I said, I'm sorry, but the, you're, you're getting ready to go into the lineup. There's nothing we can do about it now. But after this meet, we have a day between meets. Let's do something to help you through that, that image. So the prefrontal cortex fires up and it's looking for all that familiar stored program information around the injury. And then lastly, the amygdala processes incoming events, stimuli, emotion, activates the fear response. It decides what's life threatening and what's safe and it determines if the athlete is at risk of injury or future re-injury or future injuries. All right, roll ahead one more, please. So um, that's a different one. Let me see here. Three steps to treatment. Okay, can, I'll, okay, I'll go ahead and hit that one now since it's up. Um, I, I thought that was my last slide. But one of the things we, the three steps to treatment, which I don't have in here, here we go. Pre-surgery treatment. As I was saying earlier, many athletes are terrified of the process of surgery. Some of them don't bother to tell anyone. They're, they're, they feel kind of like there's something wrong with them or they're ashamed of that. But again, they're afraid of the, the doctor cutting the wrong knee open, cutting the wrong ligaments. What if I wake up? Uh, so we, well, there's actually work that we do pre-surgery to help their brain calm down before they go into surgery and have a remarkable experience. A few years ago, I saw uh, six athletes from the University of Houston women's soccer team. In 13 days, six girls tore, told their, uh, tore their ACLs. And uh, three of them came to see me before surgery. They went through surgery. They experienced less pain, less fear, less trauma. They hit the rehab process and did great. Two of them saw me about a month after surgery, and they still did pretty well. They still had a lot of work to do on the trauma, the surgery, the injury. Uh, and then the, but they ended up doing pretty well also after we worked together for several sessions. And then the last one says, I don't need that. I'm not going to go do that. They went through surgery. They went through rehab. And then the doctor said, you're cleared to play. And then they freaked out. And then they came to see me. And we had a ton of work to do. So we look at uh, pre-surgery treatment. We treat the specific issues related to the injury itself. And every athlete has images in their mind of landing and holding their knee or looking down and their ankles hanging there, or they look down and their arm is bent and buckled outwards. 
or landing on their head and they get up and they have a terrible headache and they're holding their head or seeing their teammates looking at them when they're injured or being carried off the floor. Those are called holographic images and imprints. So we, we they hold up all that stored information. I'm going to get to that a little bit more in a little bit. But so we treat the, the we treat the fear of re-injury. We treat the injury itself, the events around the injury. And then we always project them into the future and see if there's any any interference that we need to work with that way. Uh, when you see yourself back in the, on the floor again, what comes up? Well, I'm fine. Or I had one girl who was a soccer player, tore her ACL, and she was fine until she looked at the schedule. Her first game back was on the same field where she got hurt. So we had to do some work on her fear of getting hurt again into the future. So clear past, clear present, clear future, the mind and the body are in the same place, and then they're ready to roll. So uh, go ahead and advance one more time there. And I don't have my glasses. That's really small. That says, uh, help them learn from the experience. Um, there should be one other one in there. Uh, believe it or not, a serious sports-related injury is an excellent time for an athlete to learn about themselves, to grow, uh, to develop character, to develop, to develop resilience, um, learn patience. Many times patience is one of the huge virtues that they, uh, that they develop as they work their way through the injury. They learn to see the big picture. I know I had knee replacement surgery eight years ago, and my workout the first day was to fire my quad for five seconds. And I did that like 10 times or something and then got up and did leg lifts and I was exhausted uh, because the replacement surgery is a pretty traumatic experience, but I was absolutely exhausted, but I had to progress from that to eventually being able to lift my leg over a cone, get on a bike and move back and forth until I could eventually go full range of motion. So I had to learn uh, to see the big picture. I had to learn how to develop patience. Um, a couple of things, go ahead and advance because there should be a slide in there about some of the symptoms that we look at. Okay, well, I'm gonna add some things because I didn't include them in my PowerPoint. So here we go. What I look for uh, when an athlete walks into my office, um, I can usually tell that they're suffering, especially with concussion, uh, because there's, there's something about their eyes. Their eyes are usually very, very dull. Their face is kind of discolored and I often see that with ACL injuries, their, their changes in social life drive, they experience a lot of anxiety. Um, some are angry, some are hesitant, some aren't, uh, they won't attack their rehab process uh, like, they, like they should be attacking the rehab process. Like I had one gymnast who uh, tore their Achilles and they were taking like two hours with their rehab session. And so they said, well, we're going to send them to Robert. Their, their trainer said, we're going to send them to Robert and not let their, uh, their coaches know what's going on or, and, and their, their PT people know what's going on. And so I saw them three times, and that two hours went down to 45 to 50 minutes because they started attacking all the things that their PT was asking them to do. And the PT walks in and said, you know, what did they do? Because they're, they're not, they don't have that fear anymore. So um, we look at all those symptoms and my goal with them is to alleviate all those symptoms to where their personality, their character, their focus, their determination comes back. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was, uh, and I thought I included this slide, but I guess I didn't. Um, holographic imagery means whole life imagery. It means the brain takes snapshots of the worst part of that experience. Uh, for many, many years, when I started learning the techniques that I learned to help athletes, it was 22 years after I hurt my knee. And so in this training, they said, do you have anything you want to work on that still upsets you or that's pretty upsetting to you? I said, yeah, I want to work on my knee injury when I, from when I was a sophomore in high school. I was absolutely shocked at how vivid the imagery still was, how much fear I still had, how much sadness I still had, how I still was on the lookout for the next harmful hit coming 22 years later. 22 years later, my brain, my body, my nervous system was still hanging on to that traumatic experience. So I talked about the limbic system earlier. The gateway into the limbic system is through imagery. So whenever I'm working with an injured athlete, I say, do you have an image or images that pop into your mind when you think about the worst part of being injured? And they always say, yes, I'm laying on the floor holding my knee. I'm holding my arm. You know, my coach is carrying me off the floor. 
I'm sitting on the floor and my teammates are looking at me. Those images are loaded with sound, emotion, light, pain, perception, consequence. And the limbic system grabs hold of them and it holds onto those tight. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy for the limbic system to fire up. So Robert, when you're, going, when you're going through that with your clients, do you actually go through all five senses and, and layer in which senses might have been more affected by the injury, like the um, the negative and the positives. The positives were, were that I heard my teammates supporting me. The negative was I heard my coach yelling or um, a negative is what I felt when my finger broke or do you walk them through all of well, the things that feed into the I, limit? They walk me, I, I follow their lead because when I ask that question, when you think about the worst part of your injury or injuries, what image or images pop into your mind? And I see them do this. And, they, and then they start, and I have a worksheet and I say image number one, image number two. And sometimes they'll have six or eight different images. Sometimes it's two or three really bad images. They'll have a whole bunch of really bad injuries. They'll have a whole bunch of images. And again, those images are load, loaded with information and the limbic system hangs on to that information because if, if they go out and experience anything remotely similar to the experience when they broke their ankle or tore their ACL or almost broke their neck on a, a dismount on bars or something like that, that part of the brain wants to remember. And for that part of the brain to fire up, it actually draws energy away from the part of the brain that's about confidence and excellence and mastery. And that's why we see their confidence tampered down because the brain literally turns that part of the brain off or shuts it down or diminishes it because it doesn't want them to go out and be confident because they'll just get hurt again. So our work is to take that imagery and all that associated information and teach the brain, the body and the nervous system how to process and integrate that information. Once it does that, the amygdala and the limbic system files that information away into appropriate parts of the brain. And then it can send that, that energy back to the part of the brain that's about excellence, confidence and mastery. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. we, yeah, we, walk, we walk people through an extensive history. Um, it, it's very nice if they're working with someone like you or um, an, a, any sports psych that's in their community, whether it's local, if they feel like they need to actually be with somebody or obviously whether it's telemedicine and we say, what have you gone through? And can I speak to your sports psychologist? But we always still walk them through a little bit of the history in the middle. Because it's very interesting in the, um, I'll be working on someone's calf when they're prone and all of a sudden they'll be telling the story. And as they're telling the story, you can feel physically their fascial tightness. You, um, I am, it, we as professionals, especially with my staff are very good about breath counting and breath monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, you can it passively while you're working to see if they're getting anxious. Um, if they're laying on their stomach, it's really easy to see because um, when you're on your back, they're, they're always yeah. their heads and moving. But when they're on their stomachs, you can see their physical ribs rise and how they get angry and anxious. You could be working on their back and their toes start to bend. So there's a lot of physical manifestations of stress and that those are just layers that even if they say, "My fa I'm fine, we're fine, my coach is fine, my parents are fine. And you can just see how they're acting. Um, on the floor at a national team meet or in a training room, you can see um, if they're postured in a certain way. And then when a parent is around or a coach is around, do they get into a cowering posture? Do they get into a embarrassing posture? A, um, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know what's next posture or a, I don't care what you say anymore posture. I mean, you can just watch their mm -hmm. physical nature. Um, but I often find that um, the hidden things are triggered by questions. So um, I am a very, very active, I, I'll always say, how did you feel when that happened? I have staff members who are, are visual. Well, um, what do you see now? How do you see yourself in the future? And the way that they ask questions can trigger um, a response in the athlete. No, and, and that to me says that that limbic system hypersensitivity and that, that computer system that's broken and constantly pushing still needs to be uncovered and dealt with or it's constantly there creeping and they don't know how to fix it because they don't even know that it's there. So I had a guy, uh, NFL player come to see me one time because he had torn his, uh, he tore his left ACL, right? And his team sent him into town to work with me for a few days. And the first day he came to see me, he had sweatpants on, right? 
And so I'm asking him all the questions and there wasn't a whole lot there, but we went ahead and did the, pro the workup and the protocol. The next day he comes in, he's in shorts and he had the same scar on his right knee. And I said, well, what did you do your right knee? And he goes, well, I tore that one before he tore the left knee. I said, well, let's do the workup on that one. Said, oh, I'm okay with that. And I said, well, let's see. Yeah. So I started asking him questions. I use eidetic imagery and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing in, in the work that I do with the trauma related injuries. We start processing with the EMDR work and all of a sudden he stops and he goes, I injured my left knee because I was protecting my right knee. He wasn't and even it, conscious of that, but his sure. unconscious gave us that information and he was like, wow, it just okay. blew him away. Well, we, we see when, um, especially in the process of the question answer session at like stage two and three, when they're actually returning. And we'll talk about this in a second when I pop the PowerPoint up where they won't be having any pain. And then all of a sudden they'll be like, I'm so excited to go back to the gym. Say they're a level 10. We give them a release to do level seven, eight skills. It should be easy. They realize that those are easy, but maybe a little bit harder than they had anticipated. So their brain constantly goes to that next step of what if I can't do this anymore? What if my quads aren't strong enough? What if I can't? And then miraculously they come to the clinic the next day with pain. And it's not, um, I don't want to say actual pain, but there's physical pain. There's a mental manifestation into physical pain. And then there's just mental pain, right? There are three different levels of mm -hmm. thing. And it doesn't mean that they're not real. It's like CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. It's real pain to your system, but it's a malfunction in the brain dynamics, the neural connections. And um, they will all of a sudden have to do double backs for the first time. And they'll be like, oh, you know what? My Achilles hurts again. I just don't feel like I'm ready. And is that, I don't wanna fail. My peers are doing it. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be as high as I was before. I'm scared to not be able to please people. I mean, there's so many layers to it. And then all of a sudden it comes out, well, you know, when I sprained my other ankle and I was coming back, I was made fun of. And then you get mm -hmm. these other layers. So the often, layering, yeah. It is. And oftentimes in the process of physical rehab, we have almost three different humps that we go over with psychology with athletes, where it's the original psych of, oh my God, I'm injured. What am I going to do? Then they're in the middle of rehab and we go into how do I, how, do I embody being a rehabbing athlete and still have a purpose? And then once they're about ready to go back, it's that fear of, uh Oh, what if I go back and I'm not as good and everything else. So, so you're seeing the same things I'm seeing. Yeah. We see a three, we see a three part. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because in, in, in psychology and sport research, there's the five stages of grief. There's the seven stages of pain trauma, but there nobody's talked about this three hump. And um, I think that you, uh, you know, Chicago Bulls, uh, you and I talked about this. I think, you know, one of the most famous basketball players ever. Uh, you are supposed to be back from an ACL, sometimes six to seven months, gymnastics, maybe eight to 10, basketball, maybe a year. And he hit a year and he said, you know what? I'm just not ready yet. And they're like, oh, you're such a, all these bad words, right? You're softy. You mm -hmm. don't know what you're doing. You're milking this case. System. Yeah. He just, he wasn't ready and he wasn't mm -hmm. ready because he wasn't confident enough in his brain body connection of that small little, um, the ability to change directions or the ability to be confident enough to come down from a layup and maybe be on someone else's shoe. And it ends up being that after he worked with some sports psychology, um, in his case, there were some um, treatment professionals that were working with him that were trying to do everything instead of actually bridging out to having a psychology component to help. Um, it really did allow him to say, I'm okay being 96%. And it's okay that if I'm only 96%, I'm not ready yet to go back. And that shouldn't be pressured, which I'll talk about in a second. So mm -hmm. uh, I do see those three humps. And I think yeah. that last one, Robert, is so funny because if you get these kids and they're perfect in those first two humps and you get to that third level and they are still there's stuff that's still sitting in the back of their mind. They are never going to achieve the levels of power and strength and um, ground reaction quickness and everything because they're they're always going to have a little bit of that protective mechanism holding, and they're never going to let their body go all the way. Um, mm -hmm. And that third their brain level, won't let them. The their brain, brain just won't let, let it. And and it, it, in addition to that, with the limbic system and with cortisol and the adrenal system, they're physically unable to achieve VO2 max potential and power max potential because their hormone levels are so off that their body is saving energy for the fight instead of mm -hmm. for the build and the climb. Well, to uh -huh. circle back to one thing, when I'm doing EMDR work with 
for people, which is a process yeah. where they use light and sound yeah. to rapidly access the right and left hemispheres of the brain. That opens up the limbic system. Uh, sometimes we'll, they'll be processing and the emotion starts to come up. And then once they work through it, we'll, we'll pause. And I'll always say, take a deep breath. What's going on now? And they say, no, I'll say, do you feel that in your body? And they're like, yeah, I feel it in my knee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel it in my ankle. So that brain body connection gets activated. And sometimes it gets really intense and then it just fades away. And, and what we're doing there is we're breaking that brain body connection and calming the amygdala around because they're actually in, in some ways they're they're reliving and reprocessing that trauma that they went through so that the, right. the brain the once we're done, the brain doesn't need those images anymore because the limbic system has emptied out the emotion, the pain, the suffering, the loss the perception, the light, the sound. Uh, I've had athletes tell me they knew what the grass smelled like when they laid on the, on the soccer field injured. Well, the brain doesn't need that information anymore, so it files it away into appropriate parts of the brain, and then it just dismisses the image. The image fades away, and I'll say, okay, when we're done with the work, I say, okay, when you think about the injury, what do you think about? Every time they go, I see myself landing just fine now, mm -hmm. or I see myself throwing a pitch and I'm okay, or, or doing that floor yeah. landing through that trauma. And from a physical perspective, if it happens to be in the middle of training and they need to take a two or three day break period because going through that trauma is physically exhausting to them, which I mean, they've, they're, they've done studies of pH levels and muscle biopsies and everything during the EMDR process and during all of this. And, and some people are just so exhausted that their coaches and their parents and their PTs and their trainers, they have to be able to say, I'm going to be going through some serious stuff for the next couple of days. Please don't expect a lot of me in the gym. Maybe I can go for a run to get my physicalness, you know, to, to just, you know, get the energy oh. out. I don't want them at the gym, a, a mental head case with a risk of injury while they're going through this unlayering process. And their brain is integrating the work that they've done and that it's a, it's not a real safe time. If they leave my office at two 30 and they're back in the gym at five 30, that's only three hours to integrate the work that we did. So I tell the, the gymnast, I tell their parents, tell your coaches that you need an easy day today because your brain is processing. If they'll be patient with you for the next couple of days, the reward will be infinite. The re the reward right. that they'll see in the way that you come back with this it doesn't mean that they're going to struggle when they come back every time, but I just think it's a good idea to let them have an easy day, let them sleep on it a night because that's when the brain is really integrating and processing and they'll wake up the next morning feeling so different. Yeah. Like, like and, I've had and, athletes say, I don't, I don't even think about it anymore. Exhausted. What's the, what's so, that? They're, they're not thinking about it and sometimes they feel better, but sometimes there's a day or two that they're just exhausted and they get scared that they're, um, and I'm not stepping in your territory, but th I work with a therapist here that does EMDR as well, that they're they're physically almost, they feel like they had the flu for a day or they, they've they gone through so much emotional release that they need that ability. And if they go into a gym and they expect physical performance out of themselves, it's actually a safety concern. And that's what I see. Well, that's why I always tell them to drink a ton of water for the next two days and sweat profusely to just flush your body out because yeah. just like any other trauma, when you release, when the brain and the nervous system and the body releases the effects of that trauma, it, it releases tr uh, toxins just like a deep tissue massage or something like that. So I always tell them, flush your body out, sweat a bunch, and it helps with the integration process. Great. So I am going to kind of flip uh, to, I'm going to touch on a couple things, which we're going to expand on in the second and third editions. Um, I am going to go through the physical aspects of, of pain and then injury and recovery process, um, how the body processes trauma, um, medical team, uh, that aspect. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about um, what happens to the body when there is a negative atmosphere. Um, a lot of what we go through with the Safe Sport courses, I actually have some uh, screenshots and some things to share with you as well. So Robert, I am going to um, pull you off right now. We can still hear you and I am okay. going to then pull up the um, slides. Thank you guys for being uh, so patient in our home offices, right? Um, let me get, oh. Share screen, and there she is. Okay, so 
let's have a see if we can get this work my powerpoint is on the medgym youtube site so if anybody thinks that this is too small which i'm fairly certain um you will uh <laughs> you are welcome to um pop that over i am going to go to a full screen and see if we can do a little bit of a play. Okay, so overcoming injuries, understanding the relationship between psychology and physiology, very, very important to me. Um, as a holistic healthcare professional from the very beginning, um, I was, uh, as a PT after I graduated, I always, always wanted to create the concept of medical teams and make sure that others were willing to give everybody a little bit of kudos and a little bit of a piece of the process. Uh, no one person can do it all. Gymnastics as a culture tends to be that coaches are the strength trainers and the helpers for the parents and the schedulers, and they kind of do a little bit of everything. And I think when uh, when the PTs don't overstep their bounds and just give um, releases but not exact uh, direction of things to do, it's great. And when coaches don't give medical advice um, if they're not supposed to, then that's great too. Everyone needs to play in their own pod. So um, that's kind of where we're going to go with it today. Here's kind of a summary of what we're going to talk about, why this is a relevant topic currently in the um, atmosphere that we are in from a media perspective with the coaches and the abuse scandals, as well as injuries and how far we have come in such a positive way for treating and having a medical team that is around our athletes the physical stages of injury, the pain process and stages, return and the progression, medical staff group dynamics, uh, peer pressure within the gymnastics culture, which is very important uh, for people to understand. I do get a kick out of going to whatever conference, whether it's a strength and conditioning conference, an academy of um, sports conference, uh, congresses, etc. When we have people come in that weren't gymnasts, haven't worked with gymnasts and don't understand gymnasts and are talking about um, the culture that exists in the gym, like, oh, why aren't they taking a break in the middle of the day for an hour to eat a sandwich and how that doesn't work and um, just the nuances of the sport itself. Um, safe sport, uh, didactic communication and bullying, we're going to touch on a little bit. Uh, they have a phenomenal education program that I hope everyone who is getting certified as a professional member is taking seriously. Um, and uh, chemical physical changes within the positive behavior. On uh, presentations two and three, we are obviously going to delve into a little bit more of the worksheets uh, that the kids can do at home from my perspective, Ann Roberts, and some other aspects uh, to the injury process. So why is it a relevant topic right now? Obviously, everyone knows about the Larry Nassar situation. Um, I worked for him for 13 years and um, is um, am on the ground floor of a lot of what was uh, going on. So I can tell you um, the trauma that these kids are experiencing is, is real and crazy. And a lot of it, besides the physical trauma and the psychological trauma, has something to do with um, the um, the trust that they had in someone. And it was such high trust that the decision making and the difference between white and right and wrong became gray. Um, and uh, that's the spotlight right now on abuse um, for, across sports in the country. Um, safe sport um, and their knowledge of their job, uh, which is to protect the kids and their responsibility to everyone, which is to educate people on how to be protective and respectful to the athletes. Um, current coach uh there are many current coach um allegations going on um not taking a side one way or the other but just the fact that they are going on says a lot about um athletes having a voice and the athlete confidence and support their ability to speak out their ability to be heard um their confidence that it's going to be okay and that people are going to listen to them and that it's not tolerable um to have but also um that across the uh, across the board whether it's equipment manufacturers like um tumble tech and speeth and ai and um so many people whether it's leotard company i mean there's so many people that these athletes have to know that they are supported by um, within the sport and on the on the outbring. Um, and the win at all cost mentality, which we used to have, um, it, which got us where we were, um, train, 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 overuse, stop uh, listening to pain, push through things, et cetera. Um, can you reach an elite level of athletics without, with 
doing your best and being safe as opposed to training at all costs. Now, obviously, if you have a slight fracture in your pinky finger and it's the day before the Olympics, you weigh your odds of whether that is something that's going to affect you for life as opposed to a back fracture or a, uh, a, a shin stress fracture that makes it so that you can't punch enough to actually get air and then you're putting yourself at risk for injury. And there are a lot of things that we as medical professionals, when we release these athletes, our national team and Olympic um, members um, and uh, level sevens and Excel kids uh, to compete that we have to actually make sure that we consider. So physical stages of injury. Um, no one's going to come out of this as a, as a, a therapist or a psychologist, but I do want to make sure that everyone understands the four stages. This is so important for coaches to understand um, and psychologists and anybody who are watching right now um, and parents to know that there is a reason sometimes for relative rest. There is a reason for keeping active, but yet having certain specific protocols of um, too much or too little. The concept of overtraining, which is uh, just uh, it's a big word that just means that it's too much for your body at this moment, in this time, in this place, in this situation. So um, the acute phase is the initial injury. You're fighting the pain. You have inflammation. Um, your body is focused on protecting and healing. There's a chemical imbalance. There's a psychological component to it. This is when the hormones are just raging. Um, and it's because of this fight or flight, right? And the acute phase is just protect the body. Subacute phase is where you're laying down new tissue. The protecting phase is over. So now we're starting to rebuild, but this is a very scary phase. This is often where people um, retear their ACLs as stage two, three, because they get confident that their quads and their hamstrings are getting strong and um, they start to try things that they probably shouldn't yet because the tissue itself, the tape isn't sticky. The tape with the string in it, the string isn't taut enough yet. The glue isn't glued down enough yet. And that's where we have to just trust the process physiologically. Um, late stage, which is somewhere between four to six weeks and four to six months, depending on the injury um, and uh, where we are, uh, strengthening, building on repair tissue. So now the trauma part of it is usually over. Um, if someone didn't receive high levels of manual therapy, like we do, all the good therapists do, you have to make sure that you go in and almost pull stage three down to stage two in order to restart and make sure the building process is proper. Um, and the final stage, which can be three to 12 months and beyond, the mind-body connection, proprioception, balance, nervous system, um, limbic system, relaxation and allowing the body to actually react in ways that it needs to. Um, same as um, wounds are healing, uh, he, um, hemostasis, uh, then inflammatory tissue maturation and proliferation. So it's kind of where it has to actually uh, inflame, start to fight and continue on. So just important for everybody to understand. Now, this is one of my favorite slides and I know it's gonna be small. Um, I'm gonna talk about it and then you can obviously pop on to um, the, the MedGyms YouTube and you can download this. It's a really quick uh, presentation. But the seven stages of chronic injury, um, very long ago, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross started with five stages of grief and um, the physiology or the physical aspects of pain and grief psych world uh, changed this into seven stages. And this is by Jennifer Martin. And I think it's great, right? First, you're in denial. Oh my gosh, I'm not injured. I'm going to pretend like it's not painful, but I feel like I have to tell my mom and my coach, they don't work with enough gymnasts to understand. So maybe it's really not that bad. Um, or mom says, how's your knee? It's fine, mom. I promise you it's fine. And they just keep going on. Or the coach says, it's really not that bad. She's still tumbling or um, please go get more opinions. Number two, pleading, bargaining, and desperation. It really doesn't hurt that bad. Some can mask the pain and push through, making it worse. They plead with the doctor to not be off as much. Please don't call my coach, especially if you're at national team um, camps or issues. And they say, I know we're all supposed to talk, but please don't because I really want to do this meet. They encourage everybody to seek more opinions. They find gimmicks like the next, next best cure out of their friend's trunk or, you know, some, some machine that's amazing in some other country, um, or the coach is suggesting going to their doctor so they can be released on a new timeline, which is um, probably more convenient for the coach sometimes than the actual recovery process. Um, third stage, anger. Mad uh, at many people, mad that people don't agree, mad that they need to take time off, angry that they're missing their season. Um, although none of this can be changed, they still have anger that they need to do, that they need to deal with. And this often relates back to the amygdala and the limbic system, 
the hippocampus and the hyperactivity, the amped up nature of it, um, not understanding past versus present. So even though it might've been six weeks ago, they're still angry that they just got injured. Uh, these layers need to be released, often trying to place external blame on injury. Um, number four, anxiety and depression. Now I'm getting nervous. Will I return good enough? Oh my gosh, I haven't done back tucks in so long. I haven't even lifted my leg after ACL surgery. It's like a dead weight. Um, can I make it through rehab? Rehab is really tough. Holy cow. Um, I'd rather be doing gymnastics. It's easier. It's like I say, I'd rather be working than staying home with my kids. This whole COVID thing has changed things, right? Um, can I stay uh, the same weight and fitness level? Often a big concern for our athletes. Depression leads to chemical changes. Chemical changes often affect how muscle tissue tissue is laid down, tissue proliferation. It affects local pH levels. Um, it makes things more acidic. Um, affects people's motivation and timeline and confidence and everything. Number five, loss of self and often confusion. Assuming the role of a recovering injured athlete is what we always tell people. We want to give them tank tops and t-shirts that say, this is my role. I am, I am a gymnast still. I'm on a break. I am now a recovering injured athlete. And this job is just as important as this job. It's just different. You're still a gymnast. I'm recovering. My job is to go to therapy. My job is to do my conditioning in the best form possible to, uh, to just make sure that the amount of energy that they put in to actually actually their, their workouts, they put into their recovery, including the mental, the, the physical aspect of things, the recovery, sleep, nutrition, every aspect of it. Um, Reevaluation, number six, of life goals and roles. Often this happens after they question whether they can do this or not. Should I just quit? Uh, should I go to a division two college instead of one? Because I don't know that I'm going to be able to be good enough. Is my coach going to trust that I'm going to be back? PT talks to the coach and says after an ACL, no problem. They're going to be good as new. And they say, I don't really trust that the coach believes my PT. And there's just this constant doubting. Um, and that needs to, uh, these are these are concerns that are um, not, they're valid to the person because they're feeling them, but they're not probable or plausible. And that's where working with um, your sports psych is super important. Uh, last stage, of course, is acceptance. Acceptance. This is how it is. I have a set plan. All my team is on the pa same page. And by team, I mean their medical staff and parents and team to accomplish this goal with good communication. Um, every time a, a person gets injured and they're out for a significant amount of time, the coach, the parents, and their medical team must, must, must do conference calls and Zoom meetings and get on the same page. There is no tin can theory of he said this and she said this. So every time somebody rephrases something, they put their own um, connotation to the denotation, and we just need to make sure that we're all together. So um, we're going to flip to the next slide, return to sport um, progression, just so that everybody understands kind of the seven stages. And if you're working with a PT um, that doesn't outline this for you, one of your first days as to how exactly everything is going to go with rehab and um, an estimated timeline. Sometimes there's not a timeline. It's an if this, then this to these seven stages. Um, this is incredibly important. Gymnasts are planners. They know what they're supposed to do. They have seasons. Um, they understand understand um, uh, they understand the order of things. So this is super important. If you're a PD and you don't understand this, please reach out to somebody and make sure that you do know how to make these progressive plans. Uh, physicians need to respect PTs as their peers. We all have different jobs, but not one person is above the other person. A surgeon has different skill sets than a PT, than an athletic trainer, than a massage therapist. And although there are education differences um, in hierarchy, the job that that person, the all that everybody has to do in order to get the athlete better needs to be um, on a peer level. So first, injured athlete is an athlete who's been through a trauma, right? At first, they are just an injured athlete. Um, they are doing nothing to do with their sport most likely, except maybe watching things on TV, going through watching video of practices, icing while they're at practice, listening to other people's corrections, but they're injured. Second, information gathering, probably the most stressful part of the parent and the child is waiting for the MRI, waiting for the doctor. So by working with a medical team, um, you know, we get you in to, to this stuff quicker. Um, number three, rest if needed and practice alteration. That's where PT starts and rehab, but they're mostly resting to allow for recovery and practice is altered. They're participating in some things. If you sprain your ankle, you can still cast handstands on bars, right? Um, fourth level, combination of modified activity outside of the gym. They're not running or playing at recess. New activity to strengthen and recover in PT and rehab activities in practice. 
The fifth stage is when they decrease their rehab continuum and they increase their practice level or sport specific training. The sixth stage is where sport release is actually happening. They're actually like a level seven if they used to be a 10 or they're a level five skills if they used to be a seven, but they need to do continued rehab. And this is where it gets very difficult to hold them back and they need to be able to trust the process. Peer pressure is huge in this aspect and we will go into that in a second. The last aspect is sport release where it's, um, almost full. <laughs> um, there still is some time that they need to rehab. And it's very, very, very difficult to make time for rehab. It's often difficult for the coaches to respect that they look fine and they look full, but that they really, really need to not leave an injury at that 93% because of that proprioception and all those little things at the end that are that are done. When, when the athletes start to work out more, they need more hands-on, grass and ART, needling, cupping adjustments to make sure that their body stays um, biomechanically proper in the building process, and that's really important. So uh, medical staff and group dynamics, uh, really, really important slide. Um, the group of people treating and interacting often includes, but is not limited to, a PT, an athletic trainer, a doctor, a sports psychologist, a nutritionist, acupuncturist, massage therapist, um, chiropractor, and more. Add to this coach, gym owner, team director, parent, and the athlete themselves. Now we're at 11 to 12 people with elites. Now you have to add in national team staff, the medical staff that oversees people, local, regional rehab directors, et cetera. And you have now a plethora of people. Now, most of the time, um, the uh, sports psychologist can communicate directly with the MD and the PT. Nutritionist, acupuncturist, massage, chiropractor usually can um, goes into PT so the PT can do the reporting to just make sure that the recovery process is proper um, and that nobody's doing the same things, right? Chiros and PTs and massage, everyone should be, should be doing different things to make sure um, that the um, patient is getting the most out of it. Respect is instilled um, in these athletes, in these gymnasts, uh, dancers, et cetera, from such a young age. Um, these athletes respect their parents for taking care of them, right? Respect medical staff because of their knowledge. And at times they are idealized because they go to school and they're so smart and they put so much into this and they speak in language that no one can understand, right? They respect their coaches because they're supposed to have their best interest. They respect their PTs because they are guiding and directing their medical care. And if they haven't proven them wrong, there's no reason to not respect, right? They respect the ancillary staff as someone that the parents respected. Someone gave them a referral to their acupuncturist, their massage therapist, their chiropractor, et cetera. And because of that, there are all of these levels of respect. Robert and I talked about this last week. What happens when there is jockeying for the lead? Um, I don't mean lead in who's the director of their care. Um, sometimes naturally the doctor is directing their care and they send them to a physical therapist. Most of the time within gymnastics, or at least in my doings with our um, uh, national team athletes and our NCAA, the PT and the athletic trainer are kind of the, the supervisors. And even though the MDs are providing a different service, the, the PTs are synthesizing all the information and making sure everyone's on the same page. So I mean, what happens when there's a jockeying for lead like there's a disagreement and one person is saying, nope, listen to me. Nope, listen to me. Uh, listen to me because I went to school more. Nope, listen to me because I was a gymnast longer. Nope, listen to me because I've worked with your gym longer. Uh, no, I'm your parent and I'm always right. Or I'm your coach and I could make life really bad for you if you don't listen. This is where um, the slides that I will show you in regards to bullying and the dynamics are really an issue. And this is the most unfair thing that kids can be put through. It's just like in a divorce, everyone's kind of trying to say, this is this, and mom did this, and dad did this. It can't be like that for these athletes. This trust component and the stress levels have to be kept down so that their rehab can be there. And you can have a disagreement in private. If two people have a completely different aspect of how an ACL rehab or an Achilles rehab should be. They either need to be on the same page or someone has to make a decision as to who's going to be and who's going to be out and, and replaced in because the disagreements constantly are super bad for, um, for everything, for stress hormones um, and physiologically for the athletes. Um, so peer pressure in the gymnastics culture, as all of you know, right? And if you're not into gymnastics and you're watching this to learn, then here you go, right? So the athlete is at home. And when the athlete is at home, there's pressure to return to the gym and do some work. Just a little, right? Slippery slope. Number two, the athlete is at therapy. There's pressure to do outside um, of gym hour work, right? There is, even though the work level is reduced, 
there is pressure to still be doing more things at home. Number three, coaches and gym owners um, uh, sometimes lack the use of outside professionals due to the very specific knowledge of the sports. So they want to do the flexibility, the strength and conditioning, the micro and macro cycles. The um, There's no uh, strength trainer. There's no aerobic coach. There's no uh, rehab specialist, et cetera. Um, and that becomes a challenge because the athlete then looks to the coach for answers for all of these aspects. Then we go over. The athlete is returning to the gym with their protocol. Do the people at the gym support it? Are they naysaying to the medical staff for being too conservative or too slow or not understanding that there is a schedule and there's a meet we have to go to and um, we have to get to Italy or we have to get to nationals or we have to get to somewhere? And um, are they comparing you publicly to others' um, progress? And this is where we go back into that um, hyperdrive of the, uh, the amygdala and the limbic system and that hippocampus of self-doubt and can I really do this? And I'm really not a level 10 or an elite anymore. I'm injured. And we just go back to this trauma over and over again instead of confidence. Pressure to eliminate medical advice and allow coaches to guide return then comes at the end. There's that flip where it's like, really, I don't really like what they're saying. So we're going to kind of do it ourselves. Sometimes it works by chance and other times it doesn't. And then they get injured on top of it. They didn't rehab their hamstring well enough. So they started punching crooked and now they have a disc issue in their back, but it couldn't have been because they didn't listen and it just goes on and on, right? Um, the end result is that there's athlete confusion. There's athlete confusion because of a lack of respect to medical staff, coaches, and family. And I will add to this. Um, I've been around and I have been around for many years. Um, I started treating um, our uh, higher level athletes, national team and um, Olympic athletes and NCAA uh, in 2002. And um, I, I was very involved in Worlds in 03. Um, I have been to you know, 15 nationals. I've presented at Congress. I, I have a lot of experience in gymnastics, probably the most in the country. I will tell you that the saddest thing to see is this athlete confusion. And part of it is because medical staff in the past has ha, uh, has not been chosen properly, right? People have not chosen their staff properly. I work with a gym in Texas and Indiana and these other gyms where I'm setting up their medical team. I set them up with their PTs and their acupuncture and where they should go. And if they don't like them, then we switch people and we try to get you a team. But if if the coaches are like, oh, another doctor that's giving me bad advice or another one that wants to x-ray everything, and they just get into this realm instead of trusting the process, um, it gets really, really difficult. It confuses the athlete. So making sure that they know that their team is on the same page is so, so important. Um, okay, which leads me to this slide, nice and colorful. Safe sport communication, right? So this is, um, I'm summarizing this, um, obviously, to a fault, potentially, <laughs> to six levels. And this is just where we are and why I think the injury process has so much to do with this, right? Um, national team members um, have to divulge if they have injuries, if they hold back injuries and they lie about things uh, that will affect their safety or the safety of their coaches. It is a violation of their of their um, national team contract. Um, the national team PTs and doctors and every Everybody, um, everyone has to communicate and they have to be open with each other about how everyone is doing. How did the doctor look at you at camp and how are you feeling? Can we get a report from your home PT? Often before they go to camp, I send um, reports in for all the athletes that I'm managing. And it's just really important to make sure. But First and foremost, what is expected of the athlete, family, coaching, staff, and medical professionals is open and pervasive communication. Um, and that is what we are all striving for. Those of us that are trying to be better together, this is what we're, we're trying for, right? Safe and respectful environment for all, for the coaches, for the athletes, for the medical professionals, um, and making sure that everyone feels like their opinion is heard and everyone trusts the process. Um, those who are entrusted with caring for said athlete when they are not in the care of their parents are to ensure the highest level of protection. Um, meaning that when you're not around your parents, you expect that the people that your children are placed with are to ensure that they are safe mentally and physically um, and in trusted care. When this protection is not carried out to its fullest is when issues arise. This is not difficult, right? S simple, simple. Simple is, simple is. Um, athletes lose trust in the process when this happens, which has happened with our um, final five, which has happened with a lot of athletes in that um, they there was a process. They trusted the process. The process 
failed them and they had to now trust what is a new process, if you will. And it's very important to make sure that um, that everything is is carried out to its fullest. Um, and then the final one is what say what a, a significant amount of the safe sport training addresses is bullying and pressure by the coaches to fight and lead and control. So I'm going to fly through these. You guys can look at these because you've all been through your safe sport um, conduct. I've been through the U.S. Center for Safe Sports um, for gymnastics as well as for um, U.S. figure skating um, and the Olympic level. They're just different presentations. So these are the best of the best slides, right? The athlete's relationship with their coach is one of the most influential factors in their sport experience and often a significant contributor to their development. Trust and power are inherent in a coach-athlete relationship, just like a parent-child. The coach is in a position of authority, whether you like it or not, a coach-athlete relationship is vertical, not horizontal. Even if you like each other, your friends, whatever it is here, because this person tells this person what to do, not this way, right? You want to get as close as you can to being respectful. But the more that you trust your coach, the more that you can allow them to tell you what to do because there's trust, right? The athlete trusts their coach and has th that their coach has their best interests at heart. When a coach misuses trust and power, athletes are more, vu more vulnerable to abuse and conduct. This is what we are talking about with the physical aspect of recovery and making sure that the athletes are allowed to let their bodies heal in the ways that they need to, in the ways that we are guiding them to, because there are reasons to do this and not necessarily be pushed to do things that they don't need to do. So on a positive aspect, because we want to make sure this is good, athletes trust that their coach are looking out for them. And in the most part, for the most part, there are a few bad eggs, which there are in every, I mean, there's a few bad eggs at grocery stores and at every office too. It's not just, you know, within the coaching world. Um, but the negatives come where the coach uses the trust of the athlete and the parents and the colleagues to gain access, right? So they're texting the athletes, they're doing things like, um, oh, I think, I really think that you could do that double back tomorrow. Or do you really have to go to PT? We miss you in the gym. And then there is this um, fight within the, the athlete saying, I need to go to practice because I need to please my coach. I need to please my parents and listen because they like the PT. I need to please the PT because the PC, PT says, if you don't finish rehab, oh my gosh, I'm physically not going to be able to do this for eight more years for college. So there are um, lots of layers to this, right? Um Positives of power use, right? Coach uses power um, for playing time and you can earn playing time if you're doing well. You can earn the ability to go to a meet and represent the US. You can earn the ability to be last on an event, et cetera. The negatives are that the coaches that work with injuries and this rehab process, they learn and they know and they are smart to what the athlete values. They want to get done with an event quicker. So they'll give them short assignments to make them happy. They can use that for punishment and give them longer assignments so, so that the athlete wants to please them even more. From a psychological perspective, um, the coach creates that quid pro quo where the athlete must do X in order to get Y. And unfortunately, some days uh, your Chenko doubles are just not in your 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 wheelhouse or connecting your Tkachev to your pack is not there. And making you do it 80 times over and over again um, is not is the coach just trying to be demonstrative? And then the further dichotomous that is in power, the athlete wants to rise. And then that, and then the coach keeps rising up higher. And it's just this constant power fight. When you're understanding bullying behavior, um, and we've gone through this, so I don't need to read this, but it is intended to likely hurt control or diminish the minor. Now, uh, when we're going through this, how do we know what behaviors are actual good coaching and, and bullying? So um, I have a lot of friends who are former um, Olympians and national team members, and they own gyms and they are coaches and they are dynamite at what they do. You cannot be sweet, happy, smiley, and amazing 100% of the time. You cannot do that as a parent. You lose your stuff sometimes with your athletes and with your kids. But there's a difference in saying that vault was bad or I don't feel like you're trying today versus telling you that you are stupid, you are dumb, you're a bad person. There's there's so much trauma that comes in these words. And when the athletes are hurting and they are trying their hardest, their bodies, their limbic systems, their bodies might not be ready to let them punch as high as they need to because there's still this trauma that if they punch for that triple full a little shorter, which they should, they're going to tear something again. And you can yell at a kid over and over again, but until those layers are un 
and done, it's just not possible, right? When you when you are yelling at a kid or bullying a kid into um, do more conditioning or do this to make me happy, or I'll call your college coach and tell him you're lazy or I'll do whatever, that's abusive to these athletes. And it teaches them that the people that are in power are there um, to give them cookies to always reach and that what they are is not good enough. No matter what, if they explain what they're going through or if the coach should just inherently understand that either psychologically or physically, they're not quite there yet. Listen, if someone's jumping in my office, 99% on their right leg and 79% on their left leg, their punch is not going to be the same as if they're 99% on both. It's just not physically possible, no matter how much energy they have in them. You switch floors, you yell at them, you scream at them. It's not going to matter. And that in that just in turn leads to all this trauma. Um, bullying happens between peers often, but it's usually when there's power. Um, and when repeatedly done, um, like we had spoken about with the hippocampus and you get amped up when the same thing happens in the same trauma, layers and layers and layers. Um, at first it becomes a, a hypersensitivity when you are really, really just so on fire with, um, uh, that same trigger happening over and over again. In some people, the trigger just builds and and manifests into other um, psychological and physiological attributes such as um, weight gain and heart rate elevation and poor sleep and um, anxiety, depression. And some people actually then dumb down the trauma. And when it is done over and over again, it becomes accepted as the new norm with each incident. It's looked at as less severe. It can become part of the culture of the gym, which is a really bad thing to do. Um, so. Um, one of the biggest things that I'm so proud of Safe Sport for adding in um, is that um, abuse is also um, encouraging or knowingly permitting an athlete to return to play prematurely following an injury. So the concussion was bad, but we really need you this weekend on the field. Or I know that your ankle, that you're not supposed to compete, but let's just give it a try. I was at, <laughs> with one of our national team docs, Mark Hutchinson, who's just amazing. One of our shared patients was at a on a national team and she was um, at a meet that happened to be in Chicago and we were both sitting watching. We physically, um, after telling the coach, don't do this, don't no doubles off bars. She can't handle it yet. Well, is it that she can't handle it and her bone's going to physically break or is that she shouldn't do it? Well, it's kind of in the middle. She shouldn't do it, but she's not released yet and she hasn't done it and we can't do meat day. And so she said, let's just give it a try. So she did one, she made it, and then she stuck it in the routine. And I, I just, I, steam was coming out of every part of me. So um, obviously there's no trust in that because that coach thinks that they can do everything medically. That coach has such a bullying and um, demand demeanor with the athlete. The athlete is scared of the coach. So the athlete will do anything um, to, to please. And there's so many levels to that. That's just not good. Um, the last thing too, um, we have an athlete who is forced to do a a handstand for between five and 10 minutes and actually busted blood vessels in her eyes and had headaches for weeks and um, physical abuse, right? Forcing an athlete to assume a painful stance for no athletic purpose. Um, that's fine. Uh, hydration, often not done in gymnastics, but sometimes uh, you go an extra 45 minutes before lunch break or before whatever. And you know, you're not going to be better physically when you're not, when you have nutrition or hydration in your system. And that's very harmful to the athletes. Um, so in the last couple slides, um, there are physiologic changes with negative behaviors and stress that happen over time. And what we as a gymnastics community, everyone from, again, our coaches to our parent groups, to our, um, medical providers, to national team staff, to our equipment, to media, to everybody is that we want to encourage positive behaviors. And we want to let these kids know that it's going to be okay. It's gymnastics. It's not your in, in, entire life. All these kids think it is. And we need to make sure that the negative behaviors and the stress um, doesn't impact their recoveries in ways that actually um, prevents them from reaching their max, their MMI, their maximum medical improvement, right? So the obvious ones are you have heart rate elevation, sweating, blood pressure increase, there's nervousness, um, fight or flight mechanism often happens as soon as you walk into the gym. If that EMDR hasn't happened, if they smell the chalk again, if they feel the bars again, um, if they hear the coach's voice again, there's so much um, and Robert can talk about this, but it's almost a PTSD layered, um, that we want to make sure we stop, um, blood flow to organs away from your extremities, the ability to produce less power in your muscles. When you're stressed with fight or flight, you produce less power, but you're stressed because you have to get that fluorotine done and then you fall on your face and then you get yelled at and it just 
layers in, right? Um, decreased performance and risk of injury, right? There's a lack of focus. There's a lack of strength, tightness of muscles, decreased accuracy. If they're not sleeping, they don't have the energy. They're not getting restorative sleep. Um, they're nervous about things. And then there's body changes over time. They have a lack of ability to heal if you have um, serotonin and cortisol, estrogen, testosterone imbalance, um, your estradiol, not just your estrogen, if your cycle is off, if you are stressed out about your weight and your eating and you're not allowing your body to produce the hormones it needs to, there are so many changes that can last a lifetime for your pituitary gland, your thyroid. Um, and it's just really important. This can all be triggered by one simple um, injury and a react reaction to an injury process. Um, pH levels, right? So uh, low pH is high acidity. So um, pH levels go down. So acidity rises um, with um, injury and trauma. And to a local area, if I hit myself, obviously there's trauma and that's going to be different. But if my whole body is feeling stressed out as well, there is also um, an overall non-homeostasis in the system. Um, so just to understand, uh, we went through this, there's pituitary gland issues, hypothalamus and adrenal gland. You guys can go through if you're um, physiology nerds, I would be happy to walk everybody through this in a different presentation about what happens within metabolism, Krebs cycle, hypothalamus, adrenals, um, everything, stresses and the um, FSH levels and um, GHRHs, uh, how it affects bone mass, bone density, et cetera. Um, but that is kind of, uh, the in the the very very long aspect of of me trying to talk a little bit about the physio physiological aspect of things. Let me um, bring Robert back in so that I can just kind of do a little bit of conclusion. So you know, in in my office, it is so important to be a voice of reason for these athletes and for them to understand that it's okay to be injured. It's okay to be not confident. Um, it's not okay to say. I don't have confidence in my ankle, confidence in my ankle to jump the way that I used to, and then not work at it. Right? Then we have to decide. Here's our here's our road. Do you want to quit or do you want to stay? But we as medical professionals need to never work alone, and we need to work with everybody and make sure that everyone's um, pond that they stay in their pool of where they need to be practicing, and that we use each other to help these athletes. There is no way that any of our national team kids have gotten through this without a less of you know three to four different people from different realms um, going on. And it's so important to understand the physiology that's going on within these kids' bodies um, to just make sure that we're treating them with the respect that they need and understanding that the brain-body connection can make a world of difference. And that same kid might be back from ACL in 12 months, just like another kid, but they're going to be more confident. They're going to have less life issues. They're going to have less issues with their next injury. They're going to be safer as athletes if they don't have all these things floating and these unrealistic fears. Um, so beyond my hands, which is my claim to fame with treating and the biomechanics is just the ability to treat these athletes as a plethora of moving parts that are all together and not just as an ankle sprain or not just as a head case or a kid that's scared to go backwards or anything. It's just, it's so important to do. And, you know, the, we're, we're trying with articles to be positive about things. You listen to, you know, Shannon and uh, Miller and John Roethlisberger and all these people talking just about um, how important self-talk and psychology was with everything with meat from meat fear to, to everything. So anyway, um, Robert, I, um, I guess you and I can kind of go back and forth a little bit and chat about, um, some questions that have come in or unless you have some response. Well, can I have a couple of points yeah. real quick? Yeah, uh, yeah. We talked about when I was talking about the, the, uh, limbic system and how it, gra how it grabs information and, and holds on to it. Uh, if a coach, demeans, humiliates, degrades an athlete because they're afraid of doing a certain skill after an injury or yeah. they're not coming back fast enough or if they refuse to coach them and turn their back on them, guess what happens? The coach gets wound into that neurological imprinting in the brain and now the coach is actually part of the problem right along with the injury because the brain files information away by association and some sometimes it can make really crazy associations but just the same it's an association. So if a coach becomes abusive because their athlete isn't move, isn't coming back from an injury fast enough, right. guess what? They get wrapped into that whole neurological imprint. And sometimes we actually have to work on situations where the coach is screaming and yelling at them in addition to the trauma related to the injury. 
That's one thing. The other thing is I've actually asked athletes or gymnasts in particular who have a, an abusive relationship with a coach or a parent. I said, if we could bottle up your brain power and your mental and emotional energy uh, in some kind of a, a, a bottle here that says zero to 100 percent. I'm looking for two numbers here. How much of your mental and emotional energy and brain power is going into gymnastics and how much of it is going into defending and protecting yourself from your parents or your abusive coach? And they'll, it's an intuitive answer, but they'll, sometimes they'll look and they'll go, they'll think for a minute and they'll come back and, and I get numbers like 80% coach, 80% parent, 20% gymnastics, 90% coach or parent, 10% gymnastics. So what that answer tells me their, their mind is not focused on gymnastics. It's focused on putting up a, a shield to keep that attack, that assault, that defamation, that, that shaming, that ridicule, that conditional love, whatever that is, from getting inside and doing damage to their, their psyche, their personality, and their confidence. Which so leads it's a very, them to be more prone to an injury because they're focused well, on yeah. this performance. And we Bianca's question, Robert, that she has in here is the three types of pain reactions that we talked about before where pain can be... 100% physical, I hit you and it hurts, right? Pain can be 100% mental where it is um, like CRPS can sometimes be kind of on that continuum. And then there's this middle level where your mind can actually physically manifest pain out of trauma and other feelings that you're going through. You can have ankle pain again because of an abusive relationship and, and you can your body can literally manifest that in... Um, that is scary because it leads to blocking a little bit less. You're so scared to do your chenko that you're not going to land, that your fear and you're so bound up that you don't block well enough and then you do land short and now a shoulder injury turns into a broken ankle. Um, and there's just so many levels to that. I had a gymnast that I work with who was having difficulty on one particular pass on floor and the coach made her stay on floor for two hours and the girl's crying and she's upset and she's hyperventilating and the coach yells and says, go, the girl goes, gets disoriented in the air, lands on her neck, has a concussion and is out three or four weeks with a concussion. I've seen gymnasts who throw up before every meet, sometimes during meets. Sometimes it's not all on the coach or parents. Sometimes, a lot of times that has to do with what the athlete is focusing on mentally. What if I fall? What if I let people down? I can't make mistakes. You know, they get this perfectionism approach, but sometimes it has to do with coaches and parents and they actually throw up and their teammates keep buckets on the floor because they know that that athlete is going to throw up somewhere during warm-ups or the meet. Well, that's, you were talking about how powerful the response of the body can be, but it always starts right up here. And so we, we really have to look at teaching them how to retrain their thinking and their mind or the body is, I tell yeah. them that's just a language. Your stomach is just giving you a language. I'm going to help you understand what it's trying to say. I think um, one of my most interesting stories that from the very beginning was Anya Hatch and when she tore her um, her uh, ACL and other things, we were, so Anya speaks Spanish and her coach, uh, who was her husband speaking Spanish, and she was saying, um, I'm out of gas, I'm just going to be injured. This is in the warm-up gym at Worlds in um, Anaheim, California in 2003. I can't do this, I can't do this, and our national team um, directors and staff were like, you have to go again, go again, go again, go again. And every time you could see that she was like, D and there is a point now, let me tell you, I mean, I, I coached at Corolli's. I know Bella and Marta very well. Um, I had, I was at IGI. I was, a, I had many coaches that I was exposed to that were tough, but none of them were abusive. And when you continue to put the athlete in harm's way because of the mental capacity that you are te you're telling them that they stink and then you're asking them to do a skill that's nearly impossible and then you're yelling at them because they can't do it. You're expecting something positive to come of this and it's just injury. And I get that you need to make them tough and they're going to face times when they have five warmups and they land on their face and they need to go back and understand that they can really do this. But she must have done 14, 16 of them and on 
percent. And she was like, your take go double two and a half, whatever. And it was like one and three quarters, then a little bit less and then a little bit less and upper body on lower body. And it just all of a sudden she screamed and I was like, knew it was going to happen. And it was, it's so sad because I think that people think that if they, there is a point when I'm saying, you know, you're just not trying hard enough, go for it. Right. Um, but then there is a point when you are just physically so tired that, that, that making them do more and that overtraining is actually punishment to them. And it's actually mm -hmm. abuse. Um, I had a, a gymnast that I worked with a similar story. Practice was over. Uh, she was sitting on the, on the floor, putting stuff in her bag, you know, grips and things. The coach comes over and says, go do five more dismounts on beam. And the girl says, practice is over. I'm tired. You know, I'm I've already cooled down. You get up and do five more dismounts, but the practice is over. And the girl starts crying. And the coach gets in the girl's face and says, if you don't get up and do five more dismounts, and then the girl cries you more, and don't you dare tell your parents, because if you do, you will suffer my wrath. The girl gets up, gets on the beam, first dismount, tears her ACL. Yep. We hear it all the time. And there, mm -hmm. you know, I had a um, one of the uh, many coaches that, are, that have been in the news lately for abusive stuff I had a conversation with that was productive probably about a year ago about the definition of overtraining. Stop using overtraining. Don't use it. To, what, stop, it, it scares people. This is crazy, right? And so overtraining, the simple definition of it is that you are doing too much for your body in this day, in this state of mind, in this state of physical, state of mental, state of everything, right? So someone might be able to handle 15 volts and another kid might be able to handle three. If the kid that can handle three goes to a gym that can do 15, it's overtraining if you expect them to do 15 day one, but it might not be six months from now. There is a point in time when I think if you had a multiple choice question, all the national team coaches would probably say 40 is too many, four is too little. Um, we should probably be somewhere around, you know, six to 10. Some people think 20 is normal. So I think that there's definitely levels where people can be in a semi agreement, but it's what your body can handle. You want to work a marathon or up to 26 miles and their bones are ready because they get denser through Wolf's Law, their heart's conditioned. It's fine. It's called conditioning for a reason. You don't go from zero to 26 miles in two weeks. So um, just likewise, you don't go from one floor routine to 10. In my return to the gym um, presentation, I did, I did a ton of conversation about this, how you really, really have to think about the mind, the mental capacity, the toughness of a kid that used to be tough, but what they've been home, they don't know how to handle things. And if they're telling you they're tired, they're tired. And if they physically can't jump, trying harder isn't going to make it happen most of the time. And it results in injury. Um, and then that leads to that blame game. And, you know, there's um, there's just so many layers to it. Kids feel guilty because their parents are like, I told you so. I hate that coach. Or the kids are like, no, but my friends are at this gym. And then poor Robert has to deal with mm -hmm. all these <laughs> levels of, of psychological interaction. So, um, you know, physically... Mm -hmm the body inflammation that is such a result of trauma and stress. Uh, we have cryotherapy unit and um, we highly advise people to go through anti-inflammatory diets and just to set the body up for the biggest success in working with someone like Robert or myself, um, where the inflammation in the body is low so that the body can focus on the positive changes that we need it to make. Um, good sleep, supportive atmosphere, good coaching, um, good media and press about someone that's like, yeah, I got injured, but you know what? This is what I'm doing and I'm getting better and just have it be a, a homeostatic situation. Um, and so much of that is just everything from acupuncture, nutrition, psych, physical. What so, I, like, I like about what you're saying, I like everything you're saying, but what you just said hits the nail on the head for me because I look at performance as all about energy, physical energy, mental energy, emotional energy, and what you're talking about with inflammation. And you're, you're hyper training the body to learn how to use energy at a high, the highest, most efficient level possible. On my side, I'm working with their mind and their emotions to use that energy at the highest, most efficient level possible. And when you put those two together, they just get to be themselves. They get to be authentic. And that's when we see performance shoot through the roof. If they're in this defensive mode, they can't be themselves. That can't be authentic. And that's why I work with gymnasts all the time about, I want to see your authentic personality on the floor. Take your authentic personality and pair that with your gymnastics. That's, that was the real secret with Simone Biles and Lori Hernandez. You know, they weren't having a lot of fun right. in gymnastics. And when they started putting on the smile, 
you know, you see judges smiling. They're not making very many deductions because they're enjoying watching <laughs> gymnastics, right? Go back to the, like, if you could Excel spreadsheet, what they're doing, right? If physically they are only strong enough, I'm just making this up, but let's go with it. They can set and land 10 double backs, right? It's just good, 10, 10 double pikes. At, after their 10th one, the 11th one decreases 5%. The 12th one decreases 12%. We can do this research, right? We There's tons of us that do a case study basis and um, domino effect stuff with fatigue. So if they're, if at 10 is their, th their max, right? Before they get tired, if they are stressed out, that probably goes down to nine. If they are not functioning in their feed forward mechanism because their their hippocampus is still hypofiring and everything else, maybe after eight now they're not doing as well. And if they're not sleeping well because they're so stressed because of bullying and stress and pressure, now that goes down to seven. So the coach, which thinks that they should do 12, the athlete who can do 10, who's now stressed, who can only do seven, is now going to be pressured and pushed to do more. And again, when they smile and when they relax and when they change gyms or when they start talking to someone like you or when they have an open relationship with their parents that maybe their parents want them to be Olympians, but they just want to go to a really good division one school. They're so much, their gymnastics is better, not just because they look happier, but physically in their system, there are 14 hormones that change with stress. Mm -hmm. And it is so interesting to see, you know, in talking to Lori and talking to other people, um, uh, many national team members, um, my stomach hurts less. Um, my poop is better. I have less gas after I eat. I mean, it's just so many levels of the physical nature of just, um, I, I know so many college coaches that are so amazing with taking these broken kids from systems, removing them from the stress of their homes. Of course, they have different stress in college, but creating an atmosphere where their goals and expectations are laid out and nothing is a surprise and they are able to flourish and, um, it, and just be where they are. And physically, you can take a stressed out kid and jump test them and you can take a non-stressed out kid and jump test them or take that same kid, their, their physical manifestation is going to even be different. So um, really important. That's why, and I go back to as simple as this sounds, when the athletic trainer and the PT and the psychologist and the parents and everybody communicate, Robert might tell me, hey, uh, you know, Kim's coming to you next week, but I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to have a really, really hard session with her on Monday. And I know every Tuesday you jump test her. She's going to suck on Tuesday. So don't do it Tuesday because you don't want to set her back in thinking negative, wait till Thursday so she can process everything. And there's just so much to that, that confidence in the athletes and um, make, keep protecting them. You don't want to put them in a bubble. You want to put them in a positive bubble to make sure that they know that there's a team behind them. So um, I think Robert, that is probably it for today. What I will say, we are, Christy, we are going to post, um, within the next week when um, number two out of three and when number three out of three are going to be, we are going to get into some of the nitty gritty of um, definitions of overtraining, um, some of all of the different ways that Robert can actually help or that psychologists can help people, everything from EMDR to self-talk to meditation to journaling to all these different um different ways and uh, this world of resources that are available for people to learn how to help themselves and for coaches to be made aware of what's out there to actually help the athletes through this process. Um, and uh, we'll announce kind of those topics and that outline shortly. Sounds great. So thank you guys. Um, Facebook Nation, thank you Inside Gymnastics so much for your support. Mm -hmm. And you. I know that some of our advertisers and everything have been watching, especially um, Tumble Track and, and some others. And, you know, we really appreciate um, everyone's support in just making this sport a better and a more positive place to be. It is the toughest sport in the world and injuries are going to happen. You know, no one's scared of dying when they're swimming and hurting themselves or, or you know, being in the air and losing air sense. I mean, there's so much input that goes in in the five in the senses to being a gymnast that uh, that's why it takes so much more time for everybody to learn. So um, please be safe, be supportive of your athletes, go back and ramp up 
to a point where everybody can tolerate it. No one is going to go from 10 years old to the Olympics in a day. So um, just remember that their safety and their confidence and the fears that they're going through and coming back to the gym with, um, with am I good enough and I've been gone for so long and I'm going to be sore. Um, just let's make sure that they have a team of people surrounding them. This is a stressful enough time for kids um, in the first place. So um, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks and take care.